Welcome to probably going to be the driest knowledge and porridge I'll do hopefully for at least for the four years. Um, we are today looking at the general election and um, yeah, you would have to have lived under a rock to not know that there's a general election um, coming in July. Um, it's hard to think of a more depressing way to announce the biggest piece of political news the country can expect to hear um, than standing in the pouring rain, which is what British Sunak chose to do without an umbrella. Um, with the Tony Blair 1997 almost national anthem, I would say, um, D. Ream, things can only get better, which seemed to be drowning out um, Rishi Sunak when he made the announcement. The optics were awful, the Instagram reels were incredible. Um, on the 4th of July, we're finally going to have a choice. We didn't choose Rishi Sunak, the man who is richer than our very own king. We didn't choose Liz Truss, the lady who was outlived by a lettuce. But guess what? Apparently someone remembered that we live in a democracy and we can now choose our next prime minister. So exciting times. Now, we've already seen many employment law changes in 2024. And whilst we knew that a general election had to be called before January 2025, we didn't necessarily expect the general election to be called as soon as July, particularly as Richard Sunak had kept really alluding to it being held at the back end of this year. Now, the Conservatives, Labour and Lib Dems have all now published their manifesto, setting out the proposals um, of the changes they would make if elected. And within these manifestos are some interesting changes to employment law planned, meaning that whichever party wins the election, there will be changes to employment rights, which businesses need to be aware of. So current standings, look at that. I mean, Labour are clearly the current favourites to win. So it makes sense to then start with them and start looking at Labour, the new deal for working people. So we've got new branding, you may have noticed at Forbes. Um, we don't have red, sadly, so I've tried to get the nearest colour orange. <laughs> um, a quote from the manifesto, at this election, we can change Britain. We can stop the chaos, turn the page and start to rebuild our country. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Um, now, Labour had previously produced an employment rights green paper, which was called a new deal for working people, and then followed this up with Labour's plan to make work pay delivering a new deal for working people. These documents contain some quite significant changes <clears throat> to employment law and workers' rights. And those that are of note are as follows. Exploitative zero hours contracts will apparently be banned. Although there isn't a definition of what constitutes exploitative, there is a proposal to give rights to employees to have a contract which reflects the hours they regularly work based on a 12 week reference period. So they're really looking at honing in on what they believe to be exploitative zero hours contracts. Um, previously, there was a commitment in the Green Paper to give full pay to zero hours workers for any shifts that were cancelled without appropriate notice. But this is now changed to compensation that is proportionate to the notice given. The Make Work Pay document also makes it clear that employers will not be prevented from offering fixed term contracts, including seasonal work. There's also a plan to move towards a single status of worker and transition towards what Labour describe as a simpler two part framework for employment status. There's a commitment to consult in detail on a simpler framework that differentiates between a worker and the genuinely self-employed. And the Make Work Pay document correctly references the confusion that we all know exists around employment status. But to be honest, this is something that's been in the pipeline since, since something called the Taylor Review back in 2017. I think it's unlikely it'll be straightforward. It's probably one of the most complex areas looking at worker status, and there certainly isn't a quick fix on this. So it may be that they are aspirational changes, I think. Um, we would expect a Labour government to strengthen trade union and collective bargaining. And that is something that's included in the manifesto and make work pay document. So unsurprisingly, I would say there are clearly plans to strengthen trade union powers and to make it easier for trade unions to enter workplaces to organise, meet and represent their members, along with simplifying the union recognition process, which can be a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. It is worth noting that there is a proposal to place a proactive duty on, on employers to inform all new employees of their right to join a union and to inform staff of this on a regular basis. 
there will only be a fair pay agreement in adult social care and not for the wider economy, as was originally ple ple pledged by Labour. And there is also a proposal to make it easier for workers to raise collective grievances via ACAS. So I'd say they are some of the big things that jump out from the manifesto. If we look at the, the exploitative zero hours, now with a view to giving employees more predictability in their income, this is why Labour say they plan to outlaw exploitative zero hours contracts. The proposal then means that, yes, they want to be able to give rights to employees um, to have a contract with, which reflects, as I say, this, this regular hour work, regular work, regular work based on a 12 week reference period. Migrating employees, they want to have average hours contracts. Um, again, I think really this could reduce flexibility for both employers and employees, ultimately will increase employer baseline costs and create resourcing challenges in sectors where demand fluctuates. Uh, and potentially, I think it could encourage greater use of self-employment models. Now, we all remember the introduction of IR35 and when HMRC, the government were looking at the self-employment routes to make sure that people were legitimately self-employed. I think this could potentially raise lots of issues if they do introduce it. Um, Labour says that plans won't prevent employees earning overtime or employers from hiring on fixed term contracts, including areas such as seasonal work. Um, it seems those seasonal surges could be managed either through hiring temps or offering overtime to regular employees. But... To be honest, my experience is that actually zero hours do work for quite quite a number of people. Um, and I think sometimes employees would push back on these changes. I say, shouldn't say employees, the zero hours workers would push back on this because actually the current model does work for quite a lot of people, um, and particularly talking about the gig economy. In terms of single status of worker, so Labour wants to abolish the current three-tier system to this simpler two-part framework for employment status and have this one part where it's workers and self-employed in the second part. As I said, they accept it can't happen quickly and it needs further consultation. We all know that consultation takes a long time. The consultation needs to differentiate between a worker and the genuinely self-employed. And it's not clear how rights such as sick pay, family leave, et cetera, would operate in any highly flexible work models. There's a lot to be looked at there if Labour do want to do that. Fire and rehire. Uh, this has been sort of like one of the clickbait headlines, I think. Um, it's worth mentioning that this is something that is already the subject of a draft code of practice that the government planned to bring into force mid-July this year. Now, within this code, it suggests that businesses, what businesses should do if they are contemplating dismissing and re-engaging employees on new terms and conditions. Labour did seem to be looking at implementing an outright ban if they were elected. However, however, within this make work pay document, there is an acknowledgement that it is important that businesses can restructure and remain viable and preserve their workforce and the company when there is genuinely no alternative. So it's definitely been watered down on the outright ban on fire and rehire that had previously been banned, previously been planned by the Labour government. There's also a new reference to ending fire and replace, where a workforce is dismissed and replaced by a whole new workforce on lesser conditions. Um, so, yeah, so it, it is an interesting proposal. Um, in terms of another interesting proposal, they've said Labour have confirmed that if elected, they would give, and I quote, day one rights for all workers ending the current arbitrary system that leaves workers waiting up to two years to access basic rights and protection against unfair dismissal. Um, the reference here though to worker, confusing. So are Labour planning on giving workers in their current form a whole suite of employment rights? I suspect that they've referred to worker as they plan to introduce this new status of worker for all, but they're genuinely self-employed at the same time as these day one rights. But this proposal is now only going to be consulted on. It would never be implemented straight away. Um, and I said, there would be a good deal of consultation um, needed. Um, the, the, the quote is that, that what Labour says is this, you know, day one rights for all workers end this current arbitrary system. They keep referring to it as well. Workers are um, waiting up to two years, um, you know, to certainly access the basic rights from their dismissal. Um, they've been historically, as some of us who've been doing this now for quite a long time, <laughs> many changes to the qualifying period needed to bring an unfair dismissal claim. 
Um, it changed from six months. We've seen it change from six months to two years. The most recent change, it still feels recent to me, but it wasn't really, but the most recent change was in 2012, where the qualifying period of continuous employment for unfair dismissal rights was increased from one year to two years. OK, so that was in 2012. Um, the order was made on 30th of March 2012 and it came, forth and it came into force on the 6th of April that year. So it came into force pretty quickly. But it's worth remembering there were transitional provisions which provided that the change in qualifying period did not have effect in any case where the period of continuous employment began before 6th of April 2012. Process wise, an order can't be made on, under the provisions contained in the Employment Rights Act unless a draft order has been laid before Parliament and approved by a resolution of each House of Parliament. So as you'll see from 2012, the abolition of the qualifying period could potentially be done quickly from a legislative process perspective. However, again, when you look at the manifesto, there's reference throughout all of the proposals and this proposal to consultation. So we would expect that there will be a consultation on this point and the intended changes to the rules. Um, well, there will be transitional provisions as well, as we saw in 2012. Um, I do remember when it changed from one year to two years, everyone was expecting it to have this huge impact. I don't think it did have the huge impact that we that we anticipated it may be to have. Um, but it will be interesting to see if Labour do actually bring that in. Um, there had been a plan to overhaul shared parental leave um, and pay and extend maternity pay, but that's not included in this updated Make Work Pay document. Instead, there's a commitment to review the parental leave system within the first year of government. Now, I assume they mean family friendly rights rather than the statutory parental leave. We're having to do a lot of assuming here, um, but it's not clear. There is a proposal to introduce a right to bereavement leave for the loss of a loved one and the benefits of paid carers leave would be examined. I think bereavement leave is certainly something that does need to be looked at. Um, so it would be good, I think, if that is brought in. Um, I think it would be good to give employers um, the comfort and reassurance they need um, you know, to know what to do from a statutory point of view. And it is something that, understandably, you do see employees increasingly more often um, wanting to take that time after a period of bereavement leave. Um, there's also a proposal for the right to work flexibly to be the default for all workers quote, except where this is not reasonably feasible. Well, what does that mean? Um, now, does this mean that eight statutory reasons for turning down a request will no longer be available? I think that might be the case. Of course, the right to, work, to request to work flexibly is already a day one right from the 6th of April this year. Um, Labour also say there will also be a right to switch off brought in where workers will have the right to disconnect from work outside of working hours and not be contacted by their employer during this time. This reflects the concept which is already in place in countries such as France and Belgium. Now, I do think interesting narrative about that would be, personally, as a working mum with two young children, I love to have the ability that actually it suits me sometimes to work outside of hours when you're juggling lots of caring responsibilities, um, and you would, I wouldn't want to see that suddenly taken away from me. So it will be interesting to see the devil with the detail and actually if that disproportionately impacts on, for example, people with caring responsibilities. Um, it also looks like there'll be a change to redundancy consultation provisions, meaning that the current case law will effectively be reversed and the duty to collectively consult will occur when looking at the number of redundancies over the whole business rather than at each workplace, which is the law at present. Bringing a claim. There is a proposal that the time limit for bringing a claim at the Employment Tribunal would increase to six months for all claims. My views on that, this would increase uncertainty, but also allow more time to resolve complaints before claims need to be filed. So we all know it's incredibly annoying when you're nearly at the point of you know, settling a potential claim, but then we're up against it time-wise and the claim preserves their position by lodging a claim in the tribunal um, when we still say perhaps negotiating settlement agreement terms or a COP3 agreement. Um, so I think if it is extended, it would allow more time to resolve complaints before that ET1 needs to be lodged. And um, overall, I think it's definitely likely to result in more tribunal claims without a shadow of a doubt. And tribunals will need to cater for this with increased resourcing and more judges. 
We all know the state of the tribunal system at the minute. We're having cases um, listed in 2026 now. Um, so unfortunately, I do think that the tribunal will have to do a lot of work to make sure um, that they can cope with the influx of more claims. Um, many, I know that some of my clients um, online here, many in the hospitality industry, they'll be aware that there is a, currently a draft statutory code of practice on the fair and transparent distribution of tips that was approved by the House of Lords in May this year. What do Labour propose to do on this? Well, this make work pay document states that Labour will strengthen the law to ensure hospitality workers receive their tips in full and workers decide how tips are allocated, which is slightly different to the wording um, in the current legislation. So we all need to see what Labour government do about that because that could be massive. Um, also worth noting that Labour plan to remove the current age bands in place, which determine the levels of national minimum wage payable. So all adults receive the same rate. So that could be significant for businesses. Um, so that's definitely something to watch out for as well. Um, in terms of was there anything missing from the Make Work Pay publication we'd expected to see? Yes, there was. Um, there's reference in the manifesto to Labour introducing protection from menopause discrimination, which we hadn't seen before, although there had been a proposal that employers with more than 250 employees would need to produce a menopause action plan, um, along with a commitment to strengthen protection against dual discrimination. There'd been murmurings about Labour planning to abolish the apprenticeship levy and replace it with a growth and skills levy and also to introduce a new Race Equality Act to tackle structural racism, but these weren't included in the Make Work Pay document. So that's a very, very whistle-stop tour overview of Labour and what Labour are talking about. Silence on some of the things that we thought they would be talking about, um, but yeah, there's certainly some issues that if they do tend to bring in, will have a huge impact on businesses. Tory, the Conservative Party, they published their manifesto on the 11th of June, what strikes you when reading this is that it's quite light on specific employment law pledges. Um, it does quite clearly state, though, that if re-elected, the Tories would never, quote, introduce Labour's package of French-style union rules and would, and I'm quoting here, retain the flexible and dynamic labour market that gives businesses the confidence to create jobs and invest in their workforce. So clearly the Conservatives are not going to adopt the interventionist approach, which Labour are definitely championing. And when you delve deeper into the detail of the manifesto, there's definitely some employment law proposals which will be of interest to business owners. If we look at strike action. So one of these is the one of the big points is the Tories plan to continue to implement the Strikes Minimum Service Levels Act 2023. Now, this attempts to alleviate the disruption caused by strikes by specifying minimum service levels for certain public services, including health, fire and rescue, education and transport. Now, it's already prompted quite a strong reaction, as you may anticipate from some unions, with the Fire Brigades Union General Secretary suggesting that this proposal is a, quote, further declaration of war on trade unions and workers' rights. It does represent a major change to UK trade union law. Although the practical impact will depend on the content of their future regulations, the Act will allow the government to curtail trade unions' powers, which they never like, to cause mass disruption to public services through lawful industrial action. It is worth noting, however, that the Act does not restrict unions from calling for industrial action, short of strikes, such as overtime bans, which are still materially impacting on services across, for example, the railway network. Um, there's already um, an ongoing challenge of the government's decision to impose minimum service levels during strikes. The High Court has recently granted the Public and Commercial Services Union permission to pursue a judicial review of the government's decision to impose these minimum service levels during strikes. And there's going to be a substantive hearing on that later this year. So that's definitely one to look out for. Fit note reform. Um, Rishi Sunak, again, a bit of a clickbait. This one you've seen headlines probably in the newspapers, um, on news websites. Well, the fit note process, Rishi says, will be overhauled if they are re-elected so that people are not signed off sick as a default. The fit note process will be overhauled um, and they said that a new system will be introduced where the responsibility of issuing fit notes will be moved away from GPs to specialist work and health professionals, but there's no more input given as to what that means. Um, they plan to test integrating this with the new WorkWell service to provide tailored support to help people stay in or return to work. 
national living wage. So this is the minimum hourly rate that can be paid to those who are 21 or over. That would be maintained at two thirds of median earnings in each year of the next parliament. Current forecast would mean it rising to about £13 an hour, which could be a significant financial burden for many businesses. Um, Conservatives would reduce employee national insurance to 6% as part of what they see as a longer term plan to remove national insurance altogether. Separate pledge there is to abolish the main rate of self-employed national insurance by the end of next parliament term. Now, apprenticeships feature quite heavily in all of the manifestos. And in terms of the Conservatives, they say they would create 100,000, very high, very round number, high quality apprenticeships in England every year by the end of next parliament, which would be funding by, funded by, quote, curbing the number of poor quality university degrees. That's quite a bold statement. Um, there's some tax provisions included in their manifesto, such as an additional 2p being taken off employee national insurance contributions. So that would be 6%, as I say, by April 2027, they say. Um, and you may also have seen the headlines in some of the newspapers recently about the Conservatives introducing a mandatory national service for all school leavers at the age of 18. And young people can choose between a competitive placement in the military or civic service. So that has caused a great deal of consternation. Um, and there's been quite a bit of a backlash um, about that announcement. In terms of the Equality Act, what do the Tories say? Well, the Equality Act would be amended to clarify that the protected characteristic of sex means biological sex. Legislation would also provide that an individual can only have one sex in the eyes of the law across the whole of the UK. And when the MP, Tory MPs have been talking about this, they've been tying themselves up in knots. Clearly, they, they themselves don't understand uh, what the proposals would mean when people put various scenarios and examples to, to them. Um, but yeah, that would be quite a significant change. Um, in terms of anything that's not included in the manifesto that we expected to see, it's silent on the reintroduction of employment tribunal fees. Um, so totally silent on that. We did expect it to say that. It's silent on introducing a statutory cap of three months on non-compete clauses in employment contracts. Um, we did expect to say, uh, see that. And it's also silent on the development and improvement of the current whistleblowing regime. Now, the reason we expected that them all to be mentioned is because they've all been the subject of recent consultations and reviews. So we did expect them to feature in the manifesto. And now moving on to the Liberal Democrats. So a summary of their reforms. So there is a plan to replace the apprenticeship levy with a skills and training levy and to scrap the lower apprenticeship rate um, um, of the national minimum wage. Currently £6.40 an hour for those who are aged 19 or age 19 or over. And in the first year of apprenticeship, if this rate was increased, it would have a significant financial impact on businesses that utilise apprentices. Continuing on the theme of national minimum wage, a day for the Democrats plan to create a new carer's minimum wage where the minimum wage for care workers would be increased by £2 an hour. Again, significant impact. Alongside this, a worker protection enforcement authority would enforce the national minimum wage, tackle modern slavery and protect agency workers. There would be an introduction of a dependent contractor employment status with entitlement to basic rights such as minimum earnings, sick pay, holiday entitlement. The changes of note include that subject to significant business reasons, everyone would have the right to flexible working and every disabled person the right to work from home. So that, that would be huge. Obviously, it's not a minute looking like that Lib Dems would get in, but some of their um, um, potential introductions would have a huge impact on businesses. There's quite a unique proposal by the Lib Dems to make caring a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, along with requiring reasonable adjustments for employees with caring responsibilities. Again, not sure who we're talking about. Are we talking about carers where, um, you know, potentially, with, uh, say, elder uh, members of your family, caring responsibilities for younger members of your family? Um, it's not really clear. But um, yeah, that could be huge. There would also be an introduction of paid carers leave along with guaranteed regular respite breaks. And there'd also be an introduction of a weekly allowance for all kinship carers. There's also some proposals by the Lib Dem to enhance family friendly rights, such as the introduction of paid neonatal care leave, making parental leave and paid uh, pay day one rights. So they're really focusing, I think, the Lib Dems on family friendly rights. 
In terms of interesting equality, diversity, inclusion proposals, they want to encourage the use of name blind recruitment processes, which means removing a candidate's name and other personal information from CVs or application forms, such as their nationality, university they attended, for example, for social mobility reasons. And the aim is to, of this is to build a more diverse and inclusive workforce that better reflects society. There'd also be a requirement for large employers to publish data on gender, ethnicity, disability, LGBTQ plus um, individuals and employment levels, pay gaps and progression, and for there to be an introduction of adjustment passports to move support and equipment between jobs. And I really like the full slide here. I thought that's actually quite, um, that, that's quite good. And that could really help businesses um, if individuals are able to help, you know, and to transition support equipment between jobs for, say, for example, disabled people. Um, so, yeah, that's the Lib Dems reforms. Now, I've just got a few more checking my alarm. I've just got four minutes left. So where do I end? And um, so it's a whistle stop tour just looking at the proposals. And I thought, well, where shall we end with this? I was reading an article and I was both shocked and delighted when I read that earlier this year, there was an event called the Women of the World Festival. And Queen Camilla held up two stones that had been hurled at the windows of Buckingham Palace in May 1914. The stones had been thrown by two women and each carried a message on which the with the justification for their action was written. One of the messages was, constitutional methods being ignored, drivers to window smashing. And another had the note written on it, if a constitutional deputation is refused, we must present a stone message. The stones broke through Buckingham Palace glass windows, probably landed on the carpet inside the palace. Now, rather than throwing them away, as we might have expected, King George V and Queen Mary instead have clearly chose to keep at least two of the stones, perhaps as souvenirs or mementos, which is how Queen Camilla came to share them with the audience at this festival. And she paid tribute to the women who threw these stones at Buckingham Palace and who were behind the protest. The suffragettes had attacked Buckingham Palace and Camilla in 2024 was paying tribute to them. And so should we. It was a brave move by Camilla that ran the risk of criticism from Tories and misogynists. Camilla spoke of the suffragettes ambition to make this world a better place for women. I don't remember any other royal endorsing the actions of the women's movement, especially what is provocative, controversial and risky as the Women's Social and Political Union, which led the campaign for suffrage. The same month, 1914, is when these two stones had been thrown and smashed the windows in Buckingham Palace. A crowd of suffragettes had tried to enter the palace to present a petition demanding votes for women to the king. He refused, he'd already refused to meet the women. They just turned up anyway. Um, they were the kind of women who didn't take no for an answer. Faced with 1,500 police, this is in 1914, all armed with truncheons, the protest quickly turned ugly and quickly turned into a riot. 66 women and two men were arrested. Most of those were sentenced to between two weeks and three months in prison. The suffragettes' tactics were divisive. They were controversial. They described their work by a slogan, deeds, not words. They went on marches, they got arrested. They took personal risks to remind politicians and the press that they would not stop until the vote was won. Hundreds of women served time in prison, many of whom went on hunger strike. Those who refused to eat were then subjected to the torture of force feeding, tied to a chair, tipped back whilst a rubber tube was rammed up their nose or down their mouth, through which a liquid substance, usually a mixture of raw egg and milk, would be poured into a funnel into the tube and it would trickle down the back of their throats. In an attempt to prevent the feeding, women struggled. Some had the vocal cords damaged, others gagged, regurgitated the food. It would then get into their lungs sometimes, causing pneumonia for which there were no antibiotics. The women didn't stop. One example of the hundreds of stories of suffragette courage can be found in a letter written in 1914 by Dr. Charles Rigby about his wife, Edith, a militant suffragette from Preston. He, she was on the run from the police, so the wife of a doctor was on the run from the police. He had no idea where she was. And he writes in his letter, 
It is a difficult business, but for me, there is only one course, and that is to back Edith. I know her perfect sincerity and love of justice. She feels it to be the only course her conscience allows her to follow. She is willing to suffer blows, loss of friends, starvation. She is almost a shadow, scarcely able to stand, with the smile of an angel and the courage of a lion. I do not have the moral courage to do what she has done. I doubt I could do it for any cause. It makes me so ashamed and I feel so unworthy of her. And I just think that's a wonderful letter. So we debate, still in 20, 2024, we may debate the suffragette's methods, but we cannot argue with their effectiveness. Theirs was a single issue campaign that recruited like-minded women with clearly a laser sharp focus on a single goal to get the vote. Sometimes the leadership didn't have time for democracy. Often their tactics took a huge toll on physical and mental health of the campaigners. But as modern campaigns continue to take inspiration from the suffragettes, we've all probably heard of Just Stop Oil, their shouty, unladylike methods, well, we really do need to salute them, just as Queen Camilla did this year. They gave absolutely everything to their cause, making extraordinary sacrifices, including their life at times, to get women the vote. So I'll end this webinar with just one word, vote. <laughs>